right, so we're on the last few chapters here of uh, Blood Meridian, or The Evening Redness in the West. And I have not yet commented on the title, which refers to a meridian as a line of longitude that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. Um, and the longitude problem was something that took a while to work out. Davis Sobel gave a, an excellent account of it in, in the book called Longitude. These are meridians. And so by blood meridian, we are referring to um, the sort of inframing of the earth, to use Heidegger's term for what technology does. Uh, but here, the inframing of the earth is, is that of violence. Um, the earth is covered in blood. And this is a novel about death, evil, war, and blood. Uh, and indeed, in these last few chapters, we'll, we will see the triumph of death. And I think that um, it's very clear to me that uh, McCarthy had in mind uh, Peter Bruegel's painting, The Triumph of Death. Uh, there are certain images that he has deliberately taken from it uh, in these final chapters. And of course, the evening redness in the West is a double entendre. It refers to the setting sun, but also to blood, uh, but also possibly to uh, the politically incorrect term for Native Americans as redskins. Um, so there are a number of references here to, in the title and the subtitle to blood and the color of red. Red is the predominant color of, of the novel. Um, and so uh, the last thing we saw was the massacre of the Glanton gang by the Yuma Indians. Um, and then now <clears throat> in chapter 21, we have uh, the kid and the ex-priest Tobin who are out fleeing for their lives in, in the desert. Um, and they come to a point where uh, the judge, they see the judge coming behind them up on the hill and he's completely naked uh, and he's got the idiot with him on a leash um, who is also completely naked. And it does remind one of, of King Lear with his fool out on the heath. Um, but uh, the judge catches up to them and he offers to buy uh, the kid's pistol. He has a satchel full of money with him um, and he offers to, to buy the pistol. The kid refuses. Um, he's not going to do that because he knows once the judge gets the gun, he'll just shoot them. Uh, he knows the judge well enough by now not to make that kind of a foolish mistake. Um, he does get the, uh, Tobin's hat. He manages to buy Tobin's hat from him. So now he has a hat. Then they leave. Um, there was a little watering hole there where they're filling up their canteens, uh, and then they leave. And then uh, eventually um, they encounter Brown, um, a character we have not seen uh, since uh, San Diego. They encounter him, and um, he, he's fully clothed, and he has two rifles, uh, and he, they greet, and then Brown continues on his way. And when next they see the judge, he's wearing Brown's clothes and has his rifle, so he is uh, Brown's not dead, uh, so uh, the, the judge has bought these things from him. And then there's a kind of a shootout at a place where there are all these bones everywhere. And indeed, in these last few uh, chapters, uh, bones are the primary image. Again and again and again, he refers to, McCarthy refers to bones everywhere. So there's this sort of shootout with the judge that takes place um, near these bones, uh, and the kid ends up killing two horses that the judge has um, and then they continue and the, the priest tells him this is the only chance you're going to get to shoot the judge you better do it and he doesn't do it instead he kills the horses uh, so that the judge is stuck on foot and um, then they keep going um, and then the novel sort of meanders over the years um, the kid winds up he's got an arrow wound he winds up on his own in uh, San Diego uh, to get the arrow removed and he is thrown in jail and the judge encounters him uh, finally uh, and he's wearing a new suit uh, as, as though he's totally regenerated and the judge encounters him in jail and tries to blame him for what happened uh, to the Glanton gang with the Yuma massacre uh, and the kid says I ain't buying none of it go away um, so then the kid is released uh, the arrow is removed from his leg uh, and then he's wandering, he wanders to Los Angeles, where he witnesses the hanging of both Toadvine and Brown. So they're dead now. Um, and he manages to purchase the, the necklace of ears um, that one of them had. I forget which, which one it was, Brown or Toadvine, that had a necklace of human, severed human ears from the Apache Indians. He buys that. And then he's out wandering. And then he sees in the distance 
there are these wonderful surrealistic images. And here is the image directly from Bruegel's Triumph of Death, where he sees this cart that's full of human skulls just piled up, and that's in that painting. Um, and there's, they're bone pickers, um, and so they're going along collecting bones. For what reason, I'm not sure, other than that it's a great image. Uh, and it's a group of kids, te teenagers basically, like a gang. It would be the equivalent of a street gang, let's say, uh, another nomadic social formation. And of course, uh, by this point, the kid has been reduced once again to a lone wolf nomad, just like Arthur Ownby at the end of The Orchard Keeper that we saw, and, uh, or Culla Holm in Outer Dark, who also winds up... Uh, McCarthy has a fascination with these loners, these uh, nomadic loners who just drift aimlessly across the landscape. And so then at night, um, he has an encounter with these kids, these teenage kids wearing these, I don't know, I think they're buffalo skins, and they've got rifles, and they come and encounter him. And by this time now, he's, he's an older, I think he's 28, he's, some years have gone by, and he talks to them uh, briefly, and uh, one of them rubs him the, the wrong way. He goes and makes his camp, he tells them to leave, and he goes and makes his little camp to bed down for the night, and he wakes up and one of them is uh, there, standing over the fire with a rifle, and he shoots and kills him. And his uh, companions come and collect him and take him away. Uh, they messed with the wrong guy. <laughs> and so again, years go by. And so the novel, the last chapter, uh, 23, he's no longer referred to uh, as the kid. He's referred to as the man. And this is, I believe, 1878. So he's about 48 years old, I think, at this point. Um, and then he, once again, he's wandering. And we see these images uh, across the, the desert landscape of, um, what is it, buffalo horns or cattle horns just piled up in walls. Just droves of horns, rib cages just piled up. He calls them a levy of bones. Death reigns here. Death, madness, insanity uh, reigns here. This is why this is never going to be made into a movie. <laughs> you might as well get used to it. And it's fine that it doesn't because... You can't take a masterpiece from one medium and turn it into a masterpiece in another. It doesn't work that way. Uh, the Godfather is a masterpiece because it's a bad novel. Jaws is a masterpiece because it's a bad novel. The Shining is a masterpiece because, once again, it's, it's a shitty novel. You can take uh, works from one medium uh, that are not masterpieces but could be uh, and transplant them from another medium and turn them into masterpieces. But you can't take a masterpiece like let's say Moby Dick or Faust or Paradise Lost. And it, you know you can't take those and turn them into cinematic masterpieces. They've, they've already been mastered in one medium. So it, it's a good thing that we're never going to get a film version of this. No one would in a million years bother to touch it. That's my prediction. If I turn out to be wrong, that's fine. Uh, but I can guarantee <laughs> it will be a shitty movie by comparison with this novel because the director, as I've said, will eliminate all these kinds of surrealistic images that make this novel the masterpiece that it is. It's the surrealism that makes it a masterpiece. And most directors will approach it as, you know, and turn it into a realist Western, which it absolutely is not. Um, and so he goes into a bar in the final scene. Um, he's 48, goes into a bar. And on there's a stage where there's a dancing bear uh, and a woman interacting with the bear and he goes in for a drink uh and then there across the room there's the judge ever present always even after many years he's seated across the room and then someone shoots the bear uh, through the head for no ostensible reason just for fun and games uh and it breaks the girl's heart um she leaves distraught and the people are out looking for her and the judge meanwhile comes over to the kid for one final conversation where he has a long disquisition on, once again, war, fate, and inevitability. Um, the kid doesn't understand a word of it and gives his laconic responses, uh, the upshot of which is the final line that he says to the judge, you ain't nothing. Um, and the judge doesn't deny that. He says, in a certain sense, you're correct. Uh, because the judge is a symbol, even though he's based on a historical character, he's a symbol of pure evil. Uh, the pure corruption that is at the heart of human darkness. For McCarthy, um, man has fallen. 
He's inherited a kind of a Christian paradigm where man is corrupt fundamentally. But unlike Christianity, for McCarthy, man is irredeemable. There is no redemption. Um, that's just not the case. And so he interacts with the judge uh, one last time, and then he goes up uh, to have sex with a whore, and then uh, he comes back down, uh, goes into the outhouse, and there the judge is waiting for him, completely naked once again, and grabs him and kills him. Uh, we don't know exactly how, but some, some guy goes and opens the outhouse, and he's horrified by whatever it is that he sees in there, which is, of course, the kid who is now the man's dead body. And then the final image of the novel, or the second to last, the penultimate image, uh, is the judge in the bar, naked, yet again, playing the fiddle and dancing, uh, and says he never sleeps and he will never die. And it's the medieval dance of death, the dance macabre. It's a direct image. You can look this up on Google and you can see the skeleton playing the fiddle of the dance of death, which means that death is eternal. You can't get rid of it any more than, than you can get rid of war or violence. These things are permanent parts for McCarthy of the fallenness of being on this planet. Uh, the planet is corrupt and human beings are corrupt fundamentally and essentially. And the judge is a symbol of the, the judge wins because death always wins. Although in a certain sense, the kid achieves a moral victory over him because the kid is the one person that the judge is never able to seduce with his words. He is never able to get the kid uh, to do his bidding, and it frustrates the hell out of him. Uh, so he resorts to killing him. But then again, he's death incarnate. He's a symbol of death. And so uh, the last image is the epilogue where uh, we get a guy making whole, perfectly symmetrical holes in the ground, which can only refer to telephone poles that are being installed, or telegraph poles, either, either one, that are being installed, and electricity is being brought into the West, uh, which is a symbol, once again, for McCarthy of modernity, um, just like in the prologue to The Orchard Keeper, where he had the tree with the iron fence that the tree had grown up into and the fence had destroyed the tree. So to here, uh, in this final enigmatic image of the planting of electricity into, in the West, the days of the West are over. And so that's it. McCarthy will return to one more Southern work of literature, in the play that he writes called The Stonemason, uh, a few years after this, uh, although it wasn't published until I think the 90s, but it was written a few years after this. And then he goes to the Border Trilogy, uh, which is a strictly realistic uh, trilogy, and moves on to other themes. Um, so that's it for Blood Meridian, uh, McCarthy's masterpiece.